Video 12 Script Integration in Unity Now that we can make our own components, let's have a look how they integrate into Unity. First, we've seen how if we declare public variables, they're visible in Unity. We see here the MyScript has been added to this cube as a component, and here in the inspector we can see our public variables displayed. We have a boolean called alive, a score which is an integer, a speed which is a float, a description which is a string, and a my game object which is an object reference. We can change the way our variables appear in the inspector by using attributes. First, let's change the way our float speed appears. We can display floating point variables as sliders in the inspector. To do this, we have to use the range attribute on the line above the variable's declaration. To put in an attribute, we use square brackets and then the name of the attribute, in this case, range. Range requires some parameters. They require a minimum and maximum number. Let's use 0 as the minimum and 10 as the maximum. Let's save this and switch to Unity. Now you can see our speed is represented with a slider. Next, let's give extra room in the inspector for our description string. To do that, we use the text area attribute. Let's save that and switch back to Unity. Now you can see we have more room to type in a description. Sometimes you may want to have a public variable like our my game object reference but not have it display in the inspector. To do this, we use the hide in inspector attribute. Let's have a look at that. And now we can no longer see the my game object variable. If you have a lot of variables in a class, it can be useful to separate them out. We do that with a header attribute. This takes a parameter of a string for the text to display. Let's just try text variables. We'll save and have a look at that in Unity. And now you can see we have a little text header that can help organize your variables. Every component can access the game object it's attached to via the monobehavior variable game object. So we can set our class variable game object to be equal to game object. You can also get access to any other attached component using get component. The cube that our my script component is added to also has a box collider assigned to it. We can find that by using the get component function. The get component method is a generic type, therefore in angle brackets before the round brackets we need to declare the type of component we want to get. In this case, it's a box collider. The get component function returns a reference to the component on the same game object. Note, get component is an expensive function to use and therefore should be used sparingly. So it's good practice to only call it once, say in an awake function, and then to store the results. Every component has a transform as part of monobehavior. A transform holds values for position, rotation, and scale. We can use several functions on transform to perform operations. Let's first try moving our object. With the transform, we can use the dot operator and then use translate to move the object. This takes a parameter and it takes a vector free. So let's create a new vector free and give that parameters of the x, y and z movements we want the object to move to. 
In this case, we'll use 0, 0, 1. Uh, vector free is a simple class that holds an x, y, and z property, which can be used, for example, to represent a three dimensional position or a movement vector. So, as we've put this translate inside the update function, it'll move our queue one unit in Z every frame. Let's have a look in Unity. As you'll see by the axis on our cube, X here goes to the right, Y goes vertically upwards, and Z goes off into the distance. Let's run our game. Whoa, there goes our cube off into Z. Instead of moving, we can rotate the object with rotate, on this, we need to give a rotation vector for our rotation to move around. Luckily, the vector free class has some predefined directions and we can use up, then an amount, let's say one degree. Another thing we can do is change the scale of our object. To do that, we use local scale and we set that to a new vector free and then give it scaling numbers for both the X, Y, and Z component, like so. Note, if you're using physics on an object, you shouldn't alter the transform to affect movement, but instead apply forces. This is a good point for me to mention delta time. Delta means change in, so delta time is change in time. The delta time property of the time class gives us a floating point value representing the time between each update. This value is important for calculations involving movement as it can smooth out any variations in frame time. We'll add it into our translate parameter to compensate for the changes in frame time. So if we multiply our vector by the time class dot delta time, it'll smooth out any jutters in our movement. We'll save and check this in Unity. Now when we run the game, we get a very smooth movement. It's obviously a lot slower before, but that's because we're timesing by delta time, which will be a small fraction of a second. It won't take long before you need to respond to user input in your game. We do this by using Unity's input class. We'll have a quick look here about how we can detect key presses. The input class provides three different functions for detecting key presses. We have get key down. This is used to detect when a key has just been pressed. It takes a parameter and the parameter is a key code. The key code is a way of specifying which key we want to test for. Let's try space. These functions return a boolean so we can check whether this is true. And if it is, then we can do our movement. Let's save this and switch back to Unity. And when we run the game now, you'll see the cube isn't moving. It'll only move when it detects that the space bar has gone down. You see it's making little tiny jumps when I press my space bar. Instead of checking when the key is down, we can also use key up. And that detects when the key that you're checking for has just been released. But in our case, a more useful function to use would be get key. This just detects if the key is being held down or not. Let's save and try that in Unity. Now, when I press the keyboard, it moves as long as I've got the key pressed down. There's a more flexible system called Get Button and Get Axis in Unity, which is beyond the scope of this video. We'll have a look at this later, but if you want to find out more, check the documentation. We can enable or disable a component by using the component's enable flag. Here in the code, I've added a private light variable called myLight, 
and in the awake function I've set that to get component light. Now inside our get key upcode we can set the my lights enabled flag to be equal to the inverse of the current setting of enabled. This basically should toggle the light on and off when we press the spacebar. Let's save that and switch to Unity. Here you can see on our cube I've added a light component. Let's press run. And now when I press the spacebar it turns the light on and off. You can see that it's the enable flag on the component is turning on and off when I press the spacebar. Along with enable and disabling components, we can activate or deactivate the entire object that our script is attached to. We do this using the game object's setActive function. This disables or enables the whole object in the scene and any child objects. Inside our key press code, let's use game object and setActive and we'll set it to false. Let's save and run this. And now when I press spacebar, the whole object is disabled. You can check whether a game object is active by using the active self property. This will be true if the object itself is active. There is also active in hierarchy. This will be true if the object is active within the hierarchy it belongs to. Let's quickly go over the awake and start functions. Both of these are automatically run when a script is loaded. The awake function is called first and then the start method. Awake is called even if the script component is not enabled. This is often used for initialization. Start is called after awake and immediately before the first update, but only if the component is enabled. Note that start and awake are only called once in the lifetime of a script. Next, I'll briefly talk about update and fixed update. Update is the most commonly used method in Unity. It's called every frame on a script that uses it. It's where you put the code for anything that needs to change regularly, such as non-physics based movement, timers, input detection, etc. Note that the time between update calls isn't the same for every frame, as frame render times can vary. This is why we often use the delta time to compensate for this. Fixed update is similar to the update method, but is called on a regular timeline. Physics calculations are made immediately after the fixed update, therefore any changes to physics should happen within the fixed update rather than the update function. The last thing we'll look at is the destroy command. You can completely remove an object or component from the scene or object that it belongs to using the destroy keyword. If in our key up code we put destroy and then in brackets we say what we want to destroy, in this case our game object, it'll completely destroy and remove the object from the scene. Let's try it out. We'll press run. And now when we press spacebar, the object disappears and you'll notice it's not disabled it's completely removed from the scene. You can, if you want, use an optional delay time to delay the destruction of the object, like 3 seconds. Then when we press space, it'll take 3 seconds for the object to destroy. That's it for this video. In the next video, we'll take a look at debugging 